In 2019, the command at Barksdale Air Force Base was in crisis. Over the course of the preceding 12 months, they dealt with five homicides connected to the base. This doesn't even include the case we covered in our first episode, United States v. Edwards, who was also convicted of murder at Barksdale Air Force Base. The pace of killing seemed to be picking up, and the base commander expressed that he was deeply concerned for the safety of the military members and their families assigned to Barksdale. But Caitlin Day, an airman first class, had her own ticking time clock pushing the pace for the murder of her husband. This is Conduct Unbecoming, a military true crime podcast. I'm Erin, and I'm your host. This is our second episode, and before we dive into the twists and turns of today's court-martial, it's really important to me that I thank you. Thank you so much to everyone that listened and subscribed, and to everyone who provided feedback. Your sharp insights were very much appreciated. I was nervous about hitting publish, and you have provided me with a soft landing. For today's case, I relied heavily on court opinions from the Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals and the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces. I also referenced articles from The Daily Beast, Task and Purpose, Yahoo, and KTAL News. To lay some foundation for today's court, Marshall, there's a stereotype in the military that junior enlisted get married uncommonly fast. I've seen a number of 18 to 20 year olds get married during their first enlistment. There are a few things that speed up timelines, and I'll get into more details over the course of today's case. First, when an enlisted service member marries, they become eligible to move out of the barracks, out of the military equivalent of dorms. Second, there's a perceived financial incentive. Third, and this is the romantics view of quick marriages, getting married means you get to stay together when you move. If an 18-year-old marries their high school sweetheart, they can see the world together. It's a very romantic view of what military life looks like and fails to account for all the growing up that happens in your early 20s. This is the long way of me saying, there's a reason the first counter you see walking into a military exchange is a jewelry counter. I think this practice is also why the military has the highest divorce rate of any profession, and why enlisted members of the military divorce at twice the rate of officers. Caitlin Lucille Day enlisted in the United States Air Force in 2016. Caitlin trained and worked as an aircraft mechanic and sheet metal technician. From what I can tell, Caitlin was around 22 or 23 when she enlisted, which is consistent with the college graduation year of 2015. Caitlin got her BS in agriculture from Murray State in Kentucky, a small agricultural school in rural Kentucky. It's a little unusual for someone with a college degree to enlist. Most take the officer route. A typical enlistee tends to be in their late teens and fresh out of high school. Prior to her enlistment, Caitlin worked a series of short-term restaurant jobs, a job in reception, and a job on an assembly line. It's important to recognize that a common reason that people join the military is to get out of the hustle of moving from job to job, to be able to make a steady paycheck, and sometimes to get out of their hometown. Caitlin was stationed at Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport, Louisiana, when she met a young man named Tyler in May 2017. Caitlin and Tyler met at an outpatient treatment center, and the two began dating. I was hesitant to include this detail, that they met at the outpatient treatment center, because I can't verify what the center treated. That is, I'm not sure if they were receiving supportive treatment for substance use, or if this is an odd way the court chose to phrase that they were both receiving outpatient care for literally anything else. This is a really interesting fact that I unfortunately could not find much more information on. In true military fashion, Tyler and Caitlin tied the knot two months later, in July 2017. Approximately two weeks after they wed, while they were probably still in the process of updating Caitlin's military records, Tyler's on-again, off-again girlfriend gave birth to his first child. It would seem, perhaps, that Caitlin and Tyler did not have enough time to really get to know one another. Court records, perhaps rightfully, do not give Tyler's ex-girlfriend's name, so I'll refer to this woman as Jen during today's episode. If you're enlisted and you get married, you're able to move out of the dorm-style barracks. 
You can live on base and have rent and utilities covered. Or you can live off base where you're given basic allowance for housing or BAH to spend as you see fit. Some people try and beat the system to pocket money from BAH, but they usually end up with terrible commutes. If you're listening today on your own terrible commute, thank you for your service. The new spouse is classified as a dependent and can enroll in the Defense Enrollment Eligibility Reporting System, or DEERS. DEERS enrollment makes them eligible for TRICARE, the military's health insurance, and they can join the Family Service Members Group Life Insurance Program. While I can understand that dependent is really just a term that came from tax filings, I really hate it being my primary label in the military system, a system where spouse identities are functionally meaningless. Why can't the military just call us family members or something less insulting? For Caitlin, adding a family member also meant that she received a slight raise in pay, something between two and three hundred extra dollars each month. In December 2018, about a year and a half after meeting, Caitlin gave birth to their child, Tyler's second. Tyler was working part-time minimum wage jobs. And there's no judgment here on him only having minimum wage jobs. It seems like he was doing his best. I'm not saying that this totally applied to Tyler, but there is a notable problem in the military where civilian spouses are often underemployed or unemployed. Frankly, it's incredibly difficult to find and keep a job when your employer knows you will move in just a few years. The two attended marriage counseling, but two months after giving birth to their child, Caitlin told Tyler she wanted to separate. In March 2019, Tyler moved out and was ordered to pay child support. Tyler was inconsistent with his payments. He owed support payments to both Caitlin and Jen. And since he had to move out from Caitlin's base housing, he was now responsible for his own rent payments, all from his minimum wage part-time jobs. In April 2019, Caitlin filed for a no-fault divorce. Under Louisiana law, a couple with a child under the age of 18 must live separately and apart continuously for at least 365 days before a judge will grant a divorce. Setting the clock for those keeping score, that means Caitlin and Tyler's divorce would not finalize until around April 2020. Financial issues don't magically disappear when someone files for divorce and Caitlin continued to struggle with money. It's important to pause right now and review what I can find about Caitlin's finances. I can't pretend to have a full picture of her financial situation, but this is what I can put together from publicly available information. At the time this was unfolding, Caitlin Day was an Airman First Class, an E3. That means Caitlin's base salary was about $2,100 each month. From what I can gather, she did not have any large outstanding debts. Caitlin lived with their child on base. Their rent and most utilities would have been covered. When we lived on base, the only major utility not covered was our internet. In the slog of court filings and untying the knot, Caitlin learned that when the divorce became final, the $100,000 life insurance policy she had for Tyler would be terminated. Caitlin and Jen bonded over their shared dislike for co-parenting with Tyler and the accompanying financial strains. Caitlin, Jen, and two other women vented their frustrations in a Facebook Messenger thread called Hot Mess Express. In a message to the Hot Mess Express, Caitlin told the other women that she cut Tyler out of her will. She told them she didn't think Tyler had a will, but that he was still covered by the life insurance policy Caitlin opted into. She said that having the $100,000 would be real nice, and that she would use the money to pay off bills and buy a car. She complained that the bills were ones Tyler racked up that she got stuck with. Caitlin also expressed concern that Tyler, who is struggling to make ends meet, would fight a protracted legal battle and take custody of their child. In hindsight, it's odd that Caitlin was commenting on Tyler dying intestate or without a will, when he had so little to his name. What was she hoping to inherit? In a private message thread between Jen and Caitlin, both expressed that they hated Tyler. Caitlin suggested Jen have someone kill Tyler, that they wouldn't have to deal with him anymore. Caitlin offered half of the life insurance payout to Jen if Jen set up the murder. Caitlin explained her timeline that the military doesn't recognize separation as an end to dependent status, but that divorce would terminate the life insurance policy. 
Caitlin said if Tyler died before their divorce was final, she'd get the money. This was November 2019. She was seven months into the separation, and the clock was ticking. Typing it out for the first time seemed to firmly implant the idea into her mind. Caitlin began reaching out to see if anyone else knew someone who could kill her husband. On November 15, 2019, with the separation inching closer to 365 days, Caitlin wrote to Hot Mess Express and asked, Y'all know an undertaker? I'm not kidding. To the person that hooks it up, I'll split the life insurance. I think the word she was looking for was hitman, but it's possible I'm not up to date on my murder slang. Getting no hot leads from the Hot Mess Express, Caitlin messaged an ex-boyfriend four days later on November 19th. The conversation started by asking if her ex could help her with something, some quote-unquote shady stuff. Caitlin said that if he didn't want to be involved in shady stuff, he should tell her so she could end the conversation before telling him, before he had a chance to judge her. He told her his involvement depended on how shady her request was. She asked him if he knew a hitman or something. He thought Caitlin must be joking, writing about hitmen on Facebook Messenger. Caitlin clarified that she was serious. She needed someone to kill her husband. Her ex questioned why she spoke about such serious, such illegal activities on Facebook Messenger. Caitlin shared that she feared her text being subpoenaed in the future, but that she could just delete Facebook. That's not how the internet works, but I don't want us to get stuck here. Caitlin and her ex moved the conversation to Snapchat, where she assumed her messages would be deleted after being viewed or once they'd expired. Caitlin laid out her case for her ex. She explained that she was having a hard time with Tyler, his bills, her annoyance, the trouble co-parenting. She wanted her ex to kill Tyler for her. Holiday custody visits full of opportunities for murder were coming up quickly, and Caitlin hadn't yet succeeded in securing a hitman. Caitlin began asking around at work. She told a civilian co-worker, whom I'll call John, that she needed her husband to go away. When John asked her what she meant, Caitlin asked him to kill Tyler. Caitlin again offered to split the $100,000 life insurance policy 50-50 if John killed Tyler. Caitlin planned to buy a new car, pay off those mystery bills, and put away savings for her child. Though Tyler may have been inconsistent in his child support, he was presumably trying to meet both of his child support obligations, paying what he could, when he could. If Caitlin Day succeeded in this wild plot to have her estranged husband killed, she would have cut both children off from the support that Tyler was legally obligated to pay them. Her civilian co-worker, John, told Caitlin that he was not going to kill Tyler and advised her to get someone else to murder for her. John asked about whether Caitlin watched true crime shows and reiterated, there is no perfect crime, and told her she was going to get caught. Caitlin demanded he think about it. Being turned down flatly didn't pacify Caitlin. She returned to work a week later and told John, my husband has to die soon because his life insurance is about to run out. John told Caitlin that if she wanted her husband dead, she was going to have to do it herself because no one else will. What's so bizarre to me is that Caitlin Day couldn't seem to take no for an answer. I've never tried to hire a hitman, but I get the impression that if someone thinks you're joking the first time you ask, you probably shouldn't keep asking them to commit murder for you. Caitlin still didn't accept John's refusal. She approached John when he was on duty and gave him a hit list of information about her husband, his custody travel schedule, his phone number, his address, his place of employment, and his social security number. She told John that she needed him to take care of the quote-unquote problematic bush in her front yard. John understood that she meant he needed her to help her kill her husband, Tyler. It's particularly ironic that Caitlin shared Tyler's social security number with John. Literally nothing is filed under the civilian spouse's social security number. For example, my ability to access medical care is entirely dependent on my spouse. When I went to get my flu shot this year, staff asked me for my health insurance information. I had to call my husband to ask for his full social security number in order to process the paperwork for a free shot. The idea of providing Tyler's social to get anything done just makes me chuckle. 
Caitlin told John that she could buy the hit some time, that she could give Tyler hope to continue the marriage and reconcile. If she could draw out the divorce, the life insurance policy would stay active. Caitlin purchased items at a local store, then brought them to John. She had a scheme. John could take these items to the store and return them for store credit, then use the store credit to purchase livestock dewormer. This, Caitlin told John, would be the perfect poison for John to kill Tyler with, and the money trail would be harder to follow. John, again, declined. At first, John gave Caitlin Day the benefit of the doubt. He thought Caitlin was blowing off steam from a challenging divorce. As she continued to solicit John to murder her husband, John began to feel that Tyler Day was really in danger. Caitlin texted John on November 30th, 2019, and told him she had a plan. Evidently, Caitlin got past of the fear of text message subpoenas. In response, John said he was going to the police. This threat finally made it clear to Caitlin that John was not interested in killing Tyler. Caitlin responded, Oh, wow, that's a real change in position. I won't talk to you anymore then. John was pretty clearly not interested in murder. He'd made his position clear when he turned Caitlin down at least five times. On November 30th, John contacted the Bossier Parish Sheriff's Office and told the Sheriff's Office that he believed Tyler Day's life was in danger. There are a lot of ways to conduct an investigation into serious allegations like solicitation of murder. You can plan surveillance, conduct covert interviews, or contact other agencies with jurisdiction. Or you can do what the sheriff's office did and reach out to the potential murderer and ask nicely if they're planning on murdering their husband. When the sheriff's office contacted her on November 30th, Caitlin explained that she was having a normal divorce with custody issues and that John was a friend she'd asked for help cutting down a bush in her yard. Fresh off that call, Caitlin upped the ante and reached out to Tom. Tom is a new face in this saga, and it's another pseudonym. It's unclear from the record how Tom knew Caitlin. However, Caitlin needed help with her murder plan. Tom was, like a reasonable person, confused by Caitlin's request. He asked for more information, and Caitlin revealed the details of her scheme so far. She was going to put muscle relaxers and pain pills into Tyler's drink. Caitlin asked Tom, would that work? Tom didn't know whether it would work, but told Caitlin that he could teach her more about the body and its systems, and that anything she did with that information was up to her. But the lessons would cost her. Essentially, Tom convinced Caitlin to pay him $100 each month for lessons on how to poison her husband. Tom offered to conduct these lessons over video and phone calls. The true precursor to Zoom learning, months before the world plunged into the chaos of COVID-19. Caitlin asked whether Tom would call the cops on her. She'd just gotten off the phone with them because someone snitched. Tom told her she was clearly talking to the wrong people. He also advised her to stop telling everyone about her plans to murder her husband and told her that Facebook Messenger conversations like theirs were not private. He taught Caitlin Day about burner phones and urged her to get one if she was serious. Jen reached out to Caitlin on December 15th to see how the search for a hitman was going, and Caitlin updated her on the plan. Caitlin would poison Tyler's energy drink. Caitlin learned from her previous murder solicitations and said they needed to move their conversation off Facebook Messenger so Caitlin continued their conversation on Snapchat. There's a certain irony of choosing an energy drink as the vehicle for poison. The U.S. military is fueled almost entirely by energy drinks and shop at Roller Foods. Caitlin planned to spike an energy drink and give it to Tyler on December 21st and tell him to stay hydrated while he drove away from their custody visitation. She planned for Tyler to die while he is behind the wheel and presumably crash. Jen told Caitlin that it would only make sense for Jen to get the poison for Caitlin to put in Tyler's drink, and that Jen could do it for the low, low price of $100. Taking a step back and considering this from the logistical perspective, I don't know how she planned to slip something into an energy drink without looking suspicious. She'd be handing an open can to Tyler. Yet another reason to not accept open beverages from strangers and estranged spouses, I guess. Having landed on a concrete plan, 
Caitlin told Jen what she would do with the payout from Tyler's life insurance. Caitlin shared what cars she was considering buying with the windfall. Caitlin wanted Jen to confirm that she wouldn't go to the police. She told Jen that the last thing she needed was another person calling the police on her and that her previous conversation with the sheriff's office made her paranoid. Days away from the murder, Jen asked if Caitlin was sure she wanted to kill Tyler. Caitlin was certain. Her cash was ready, she'd see him on Saturday, December 21st, then she'd fly out to see family for the holidays on Sunday, December 22nd. She planned to go off base, away from people who knew her, and pick up road snacks for Tyler. She'd wear gloves to avoid leaving any prints. Caitlin told Jen that she would still share the payout. She would give Jen ten to $20,000 if she could. On December 16th, 17th, and 18th, Caitlin called Tom to try and secure her poisoner's lessons. I like to imagine that these would have been schoolhouse rock-style sing-alongs to learn about different body systems. On December 18th, 2019, Caitlin drove 65 miles away to a Walmart in Ruston, Louisiana. She planned to buy the road snacks and meet Jen in the parking lot to buy the poison. She paid Jen $100 and received a box of items. Tucked away in the box was the poison Jen promised a clear plastic baggie with a white powder inside. Jen warned her not to sniff it or touch it. The fentanyl was dangerous. Jen advised Caitlin to hide it in her freezer. Fentanyl is a synthetic opioid that's responsible for an increasing number of overdose deaths in the United States. On December 20th, 2022, the Washington Post wrote that the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency had already seized 379 million fatal doses of fentanyl in 2022, enough doses to kill everyone in the United States. Caitlin drove home and stashed the baggie in her freezer. It would take six months or so for the insurance money to pay out. How different would her life be in the new year? Would she finally feel financially stable? Would her plot even work? She wouldn't believe it until she got a phone call confirming Tyler's death. Hours after the buy with Jen, agents from the Air Force Office of Special Investigations entered Caitlin Day's house and found the baggie she purchased stashed in her freezer, along with the gloves she planned to use to hide her prints. You see, just three days earlier on December 15th, Jen met with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations and agreed to work as a confidential informant. That's when she texted Caitlin to ask how the hiring process was going. That means that when Caitlin wanted Jen to promise she wouldn't go to the police, investigators were already listening in. During the interrogation, Caitlin initially denied that she was planning to murder Tyler. Caitlin admitted that she believed the substance in the baggie she purchased from Jen was illicit and that she intended to put it in Tyler's drink on Saturday. Air Force investigators had captured Caitlin's entire conversation with Jen in the Walmart parking lot and the agents confronted Caitlin with this evidence. After seeing this evidence, Caitlin admitted her plan was to murder Tyler. At this point, the Air Force investigators only had the conversations Caitlin had with Jen, the written messages they had exchanged, and the murder meetup in the parking lot. They hadn't yet searched Caitlin's cell phone. Her phone history held the rest of the incriminating messages detailing months of murderous machinations. After her arrest, Caitlin pled guilty to and was convicted of one specification or count of attempted premeditated murder, two specifications of attempted conspiracy to commit premeditated murder, one specification of attempted wrongful possession of fentanyl, and two specifications of solicitation to commit murder. On July 23, 2020, the trial judge sentenced Caitlin Day to a reduction in rank to E1 the lowest enlisted rank in the Air Force, dishonorable discharge, and confinement for 10 years. A member of Tyler Day's family told the Daily Beast that his primary focus is on being a father to his children. Okay, Air Force, here's your safety brief. Aim high, but if you're attempting to conspire to commit murder, aim higher. All right, Legal Beagles, it's time to dig into the nitty-gritty of the law. In her appeal to the Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals, Caitlin claimed four legal errors. 
The Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals determined that two of her claims were so lacking in merit that they didn't even warrant discussion. Since the Court of Criminal Appeals skipped those, I will too. That leaves just two issues to discuss. The first issue, Caitlin claimed, is that attempted conspiracy is not a real offense. That is, you either attempt to commit an offense or you conspire to commit an offense. But she claimed you can't combine the two. Her first argument continued that, since attempted conspiracy is not a legitimate offense, she should not have been convicted of the attempted conspiracies to murder Tyler. Her second claim was that her 10-year sentence was inappropriately severe. Let's look at that first claimed error. It is worth noting that the federal civilian system does not recognize the offense of attempted conspiracy as a crime. Caitlin's argument is correct that it would have been improper for a federal civilian prosecutor to charge Caitlin with an attempted conspiracy. Even in the military system, there isn't a defined offense that specifically prohibits attempted conspiracies. Article 80 of the Uniform Code of Military Justice, the military's penal code, prohibits service members from attempting to commit an offense. Separately, Article 81 prohibits service members from engaging in conspiracies to commit offenses. There is no distinct or numbered article for attempted conspiracies. But there is a reason that the prosecutor charged Caitlin this way and didn't just charge her with two counts of conspiracy. The first attempted conspiracy was Caitlin's collusion with Jen, where Caitlin was working with a government informant. The fact that Jen was not actually agreeing with Caitlin to murder Tyler because Jen, as an informant, was only pretending to agree, means that Caitlin did not legally complete the conspiracy offense. Put another way, conspiracy requires an actual agreement between at least two people to commit a crime. And there was no actual agreement between Caitlin and Jen. The second attempted conspiracy was Caitlin's poisoner lessons from Tom. To enter into a conspiracy, a service member must enter into an agreement, and one of the participants to the agreement must commit an overt act, basically some act that furthers the goal of the agreement. While Caitlin had agreed that in exchange for money, Tom would help Caitlin murder Tyler by providing her these lessons, they were never able to find a mutually convenient time to have the lessons. Here, had Caitlin and Tom actually had one of their lessons, that would have constituted the overt act and completed the conspiracy offense. However, since these lessons never happened and there was no other overt act, the prosecutor couldn't charge Caitlin with just conspiracy based upon her agreement with Tom. Ultimately, the court agreed with the government that under the UCMJ, attempted conspiracy is a legitimate offense. Under the military system, distinct from the civilian federal system, the language in the attempt article is very broad and can be applied to any other UCMJ offense. And you may be wondering, since Caitlin was convicted, separate from the attempted conspiracy offenses, of attempted murder and solicitation to commit murder, why do we even care whether or not the attempted conspiracy offenses hold up? The government still had their convictions for the other big offenses. And here's why. If the appellate court found that this was not a legitimate offense, they can reassess the sentence. In reassessment, they'd likely conclude that part of Caitlin's 10-year confinement included some time from the attempted conspiracy convictions. Then they'd likely shave off confinement time in their reassessment. That's why it was so important that the prosecutor was correct in the charging scheme. With respect to Caitlin's second appellate issue, that her 10-year sentence was inappropriately severe, are you kidding me? This is a woman who spent more than two months plotting the murder of her estranged husband. She spent longer planning his murder than she spent planning her wedding. She asked many people about Hitman, sought lessons on how to poison him, and solicited a co-worker to kill him. She drove more than an hour away to purchase what she thought was a lethal dose of fentanyl and the carrier for her poison. She hoped that Tyler would die and that she would secure sole custody of their child and the $100,000 life insurance policy payout. Her plan seemed to be that Tyler would OD while driving and die a horrific death. Though Caitlin claimed in the brief for her appeal that she had a change of heart, I don't think that's a reasonable interpretation of the facts of this case. The reason Caitlin had a change of heart is because she was arrested within hours of purchasing the baggie from Jen. She didn't dispose of the substance, she put it in the freezer for safekeeping. At the end of the day, Caitlin accepted a very favorable plea deal. 
The trial judge was limited to a cap of 10 years in confinement. At a contested trial, she could have received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Ultimately, both the Air Force Court of Criminal Appeals and the Court of Appeals for the Armed Forces affirmed Caitlin's conviction and 10-year sentence. Join me next time where the Army takes a turn on the hot seat. Until then, take care. Take care.